trying to achieve or provide a better understanding of Jewish Christian relations in the Middle East, Western, and to a certain extent Central Asia, India, and throughout the Indian Ocean, and in Ethiopia. We wanted to give people the opportunity to learn about these places, because very often they've been seen as uh, in the greater narrative of Jewish-Christian relations um, and the history of Judaism or even Christianity as relatively marginal um, relative to Europe. And yet these places had very long and complicated and delightfully interesting histories. My husband said, well, tell me all the things you wish you could do if you could learn all the languages and had all the time in the world. And so I talked about my interest in, for example, the movement of anti-Jewish saint stories into Armenia and Ethiopia, my interest in Jewish-Christian relations or actually the history of Ethiopia in general, my curiosity about Southern India and so forth, and of course, why hadn't anyone studied Jewish-Christian relations in the Arabic and Persian-speaking world? Finally, my husband said, oh, well, what you're really interested in is Jewish-Christian relations in Asia and Africa. And so that began the uh, sort of spark to get this going. But of course, when I realized that's what I wanted to do, I didn't have all the time in the world to learn Armenian, Georgian, Malayalam and so forth, so I needed to find a team. In the Middle East in particular, which is the team or part that I work on for the project, you see a whole variety or range of relationships. So you have Jews and Christians who work together as business partners or competitors. In Judaism, you have the idea that you should not throw away any document with the name of God on it. So Jews, even to this day, but in Egypt, they had a room in the synagogue where they basically, it's like a recycling bin. They put all their used documents there rather than destroying them and these were discovered. So we have all these uh, religious texts, merchant letters, letters about school children, marriage contracts, and so forth. And they tell us a lot about trade uh, and religious and social life among Jews in Egypt and their friends and colleagues elsewhere. So the source material that I'm dealing with is really extensive, and that's why I'm very happy that we have many years to work on this project. Uh, and uh, I think, like I said, I retrieved my material from three different areas. On the one hand, there's simply sources which have been known already for centuries, maybe in Western research, chronicles written in the Middle East or, or hagiography, pieces of poetry that have been edited and studied, but which have never been studied from the particular question of what it says about Jewish-Christian interaction. Those texts, of course, are easy to find. But we also have a very, very large corpus of unedited texts, which are found in manuscript form, and it could be hundreds of years old, sometimes even more than a thousand years old, and which have not been properly studied. We talk in these very general terms, Jews, Christians. Uh, in every area, there were different groups. So the Christians had several important denominations. We have the Copts in Egypt, we have Jacobites or Syrian Orthodox, as we call it now. We have the Church of the East in Iraq and further to the East, the so-called Nestorians, as they used to be called. All these various groups we were good at writing things against each other. But when we make a large scale comparison of their attitudes to the Jews, we don't really see much difference. So, and they also, without any scruples, borrowed texts from each other. So this is a, a, such a very interesting finding in our research that there, there's no uh, keeping your own text within your own church. All these texts travel. There, so you can find a certain idea in a text from Iraq in the ninth century, 
and it pops up again in Egypt in a Coptic source in the 15th century. Uh, and for the Jews, it's the same, that they were divided in uh, rabbinic and Karaite uh, uh, Judaism, and they spent a lot of time writing against each other. One thing one could say is, if you look at what Jews wrote about others during all these centuries, there's actually a lot more attention to Jewish rivals, Karaites writing against Rabbinites and Rabbinites writing against Karaites, than there is about Christianity. Also on the whole, you can say Christianity was much less important for Jewish authors than Judaism was for the Christian authors. Well, what I really hope is that people will read our research once it's published, uh, once we've finished the, the last publications of the Jews to East project, because I think we're showing that there is a whole world out there of interreligious relationships that hasn't been studied sufficiently. And we think that it can shift the general idea of how Jewish-Christian interaction occurred throughout history, because this has generally been written from the perspective of medieval Europe, and in medieval Europe, uh, the Christians were the ones who were in command, so to say. And this is very, very different once Jews and Christians live together under Islam. So at least to take our work and make more profound comparisons between medieval Europe and then the rest of the world would be useful. These manuscripts often remind me of the struggles that are going on today. I remember some of the manuscripts that I used for my PhD when everything was still uh, relatively stable in Iraq, we don't even know where these manuscripts are now because since that time these monasteries have been attacked by ISIS uh, mostly and uh, it's it's sad to think that that communities are under threat of course so I often think about that Georgia has not been studied very much yet we know that Jews existed there so we felt it was important to try and find out more information. We did not find the same level of material cultural evidence of a Jewish presence in Georgia as we did in Armenia, where we expected not to find much of anything, really. So one of the surprises of the project was that we found a lot of interesting material about Armenian Christian imagination about Jews and then evidence of actual Jewish Christian interaction there. And then in Georgia, where we really expected to find a lot more, uh, there was just a lot less. So I started this project with a very little research done on Jews in Armenia or Jewish Christian relations in Armenia. And the idea was that uh, there are very little sources. The sources say almost nothing about this. So we assume there were no Jews in Armenia after the fifth, sixth century, or at least not important Jewish communities. And we have no idea. What happened to these communities? Did they simply disappear? Did they convert to Christianity or what happened? The other uh, noteworthy uh, part of my specific research on Armenia was the importance of material culture. Uh, the Jews allowed us to build on work already carried out by Israeli scholars and advanced through our uh, field research in the south of Armenia, in Bayot's Zor region, working on the medieval Jewish cemetery of Yeregis. I was able to organize a field trip to Armenia uh, with archaeologists, and the purpose of this field trip was to study further the Jewish cemetery, particularly its topography in relation to the medieval settlement of Yeregis, and also in relation to other monuments in that village, including uh, Christian churches, but also a caravansarai. And we kind of hypothesize that this is a village, this is not an urban center, and it was probably not an urban center even in the Middle Ages. So the idea that we look for Jewish communities in urban centers is not applicable everywhere and should be abandoned as, as an a priori assumption. Right? So it very much depended on the local conditions and the local dynamics of power or local settlement patterns. But the inscriptions in the region around the cemetery also allow very interesting information about this community. 
in the church known as Pitakavor, Church of the Holy Mother of God, uh, about two hours drive, very difficult drive. You had to go up a dirt road. At some point we were kind of, oh, do we really want to go there? What is there? The driver was getting impatient. Why are we going there? What is there, etc. But there's an important inscription in this church, a 14th century inscription, which attests that one of the benefactors of the church had bought the land of the Jew, this is how it describes, and donated it to the church. So this seems okay, just one inscription, who cares, right? There's not hundreds, but this is very important to indicate that the Jews were allowed to own land because it was known that this belonged to somebody probably from that same community since it's not very distant. Yeah, I did not mention the time frame, though the graves, based on the dates on the graves, they go from mid 13th century to mid 14th century. What I want to say is studying Jewish-Christian relations is not simply sitting in the library and reading disputations and sources. And it's not only just excavating, you know, going and excavating and finding a nice artifact, but it is also making the connections, uh, studying the historical landscape, the historical topography, the historical connections, the routes, through which not only tradesmen, but also soldiers pass. So Ethiopia was another one of the so-called hotspots we were particularly interested in. I knew that Ethiopia was in fairly close contact with Egypt, which is part of what I study. And furthermore, there was a large community that identified itself as Jewish in Ethiopia. They had written a fair amount, but most particularly had had a monastic tradition these things led me to think that Ethiopia really needed to be studied much more than it had been, both because it was a producer of texts and physical objects and indicative of a very rich Jewish um, history. A lot of what we're doing, and this is maybe a bit different from the other regions, is focused on the 19th and early 20th century, simply because this is a time when we have lots and lots of sources, written eyewitness accounts, archaeological finds, that all shed light on uh, the Bethesda Israel and their interaction with the Christians. From the mid-19th century, Bethesda society has been going through a, a very deep transformation. Uh, the, this process started when, in the mid-19th century, a Protestant mission was first established in the area where the Bethesda lived with the aim of converting them to Christianity. The missionaries publish their accounts regularly, which is why we also have a lot of information from this time on the Bethesda and their religious life and practices. But basically, this provoked a reaction in the Jewish world. There were people saying that the missionary work had to be countered and the Judaism of the Bethesda maintained. So the Jewish world also sent emissaries to the Bethesda and they were also active among the Bethesda. In the late 20th century, after Israel recognized the Beta Israel as Jews, it took a while for the state to do that. They, they could immigrate to Israel and receive citizenship under the law of return. So there were a few waves of immigration to Israel, and basically almost the entire Beta Israel community immigrated to Israel. So what is probably most striking about the interaction between the Beta Israel and their Christian neighbors is that on the one hand, they lived really in the same areas. So they had even shared villages or they lived village next to village. And at the same time, the Beta Israel followed very strict purity uh, rites. So they would try to avoid any physical contact with non-Jews. Uh, so it's very interesting to see how they still managed to interact. So the Beta Israel would commission a manuscript from Christian scribes. So that means really close contact, but they still avoided physical interaction, so to say. So part of the security rights would be, for example, not to accept money directly out of the hands uh, of the other group. So there are these stories where if a Christian bought something from a better Israel, they would put the money into a bucket of water and then the better Israel would take out the money from this water to avoid any uh, physical contact at all costs. 
in, in, in Ethiopia, also when you think about the concepts of Christianity and Judaism, you have to think out of the box, so to speak. They're different from how we imagine Christianity and Judaism in other places in the world. So if we take Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity, a stream of Christianity with many Old Testament derived features, which one could also uh, describe as Judaic. So, for instance, Ethiopian Orthodox Christians recognize Saturday as a holy day. They perform circumcision uh, on the eighth day of the newborn son. On the other hand, you have Ethiopian Judaism, which is also very different from how Judaism is imagined in the West. So, for instance, the Christians and the Jews share the same liturgical language, Ge'ez, which was the language spoken in the northern Ethiopian highlands in uh, late antiquity. So after weeks and months of studying uh, written sources and oral interviews, uh, we would finally travel to Ethiopia. We had a great team there of local guides and interpreters who assisted us. And without the support of the local people really living in the sites or near the sites, we would be uh, helpless. So we are looking at for sites that have been abandoned some time ago and also which are even for the Ethiopian context uh, remote. They are not along the main highway or so. So in the field itself, we had to rely on people who were advanced enough in age to remember the Beta Israel living there and also to remember these monastic sites when they were active because when working without having a lot of prior knowledge on the architecture of these monasteries, when working in the field, it's hard enough to identify exactly where Beta Israel villages were, to identify which of the remains that we see are the monasteries themselves, and within a monastery, what was the function of each of the structures, how did they look like. We needed to, to find people who remember these places in advance in order to identify these features. Now, when we got there, we, we documented everything that we uh, saw preserved on the surface, which we were told was related to uh, the Beta Israel. And then we would take measurements, photographs, GPS locations, and uh, continue the interviews with really like focusing on special features of the building. Uh, for example, for uh, prayer houses, it would be important where the entrance would be or if there was a special section within the house only for the monks that other people were not allowed to enter. And the second phase in our archaeological work was coming back with our documentations, with our photographs to members of the community in Israel, showing them the photos and trying to see if the information that we got in the field regarding these different features was correct. So it was archaeological work, but it also had a lot to do with ethnography. There's one thing that I really, really remember. We um, had this very exciting uh, trip to Semyon Minata, probably the most exciting uh, and near-death experience we ever had in our trip. So our plan, we took the Jeep for a whole day into the mountains. We, we camped out, woke up the following morning and continued with the Jeep as far as the dirt road uh, reaches. And our plan was to take donkeys, load up all our stuff and walk through the mountains. And we were promised that this would be a three, four hour walk uh, through the mountains and that would be uh, fine. When they say in Ethiopia, something is three hours walk, it's at least double the time. And uh, <laughs> I was thinking, wow, if we don't reach it soon, we'll be in deep trouble because it will become dark. But well, we have to camp now. There's no chance that we'll make it to Semin Minata before dark and it would be very dangerous. But he was very optimistic and very insistent and we continued. We reached the peak of that mountain just as it became completely dark. And then we reached this cliff where we, we couldn't continue and we, we knew we had to get to the village. We had no idea where uh, the rest of our stuff was. And we ended up in the middle of the night uh, in front of a farmhouse and there were people, you know, they were about to go to bed. They were about to turn out their fire and uh, retire to bed. And then there was this bunch of uh, white people coming in, uh, extremely thirsty, who was lost along the way. And those people were just amazing, you know. They took all uh, measures to um, make it comfortable for us. They cooked food. The neighbors came and brought some yogurt. I just remember that very vividly. Not, not exactly an Indiana Jones adventure, but I mean, many people, when they 
start uh, learning archaeology, they have Indiana Jones work in mind, and then they are quickly told, well, this is not what archaeology is like. You don't have adventures like Indiana Jones. In our case, I think we did have adventures like Indiana Jones trying to reach these sites. I also wonder, at the time when we were first starting, what was Ethiopia's relationship with other countries or lands connected to the Indian Ocean? India, specifically the Malabar Coast, was another area of focus for the project. This was a region which had trading connections with the Mediterranean and had had both a Christian and Jewish community living there. We have evidence about this community to a certain extent from the Indian Ocean part of the Cairo Geniza. Um, however, we also have some materi written material as well as material evidence from the communities who lived there. Both the Christians and the Jews have legends. And according to the Jewish legends, the first Jewish community came after the destruction of the second temple. That is to say, after the year 70. Uh, the Christians have the legend that the first converts to Christianity were converted by the, the Apostle Thomas. And they even give a date. Apostle Thomas came to Malankara in the year 52. This testifies to the conscience that these communities existed there since antiquity, since late antiquity. And the first local document is testifying simultaneously to the presence of Christians and Jews, but also of Muslims and also Zoroastrians. And the document is dated 849. What we have is not the original document, but, an, but a copy. On the last copper plate, there are signatures. Signatures by Muslims first, then Christians, Zoroastrians, and Jews. The signatures are written in three types of characters. The Muslims are signing in Kufic Arabic script. The Christians and the Zoroastrians are signing in Pehlevi. And the Jews are signing in Hebrew characters. But it's written only in, th in two languages. The Muslims are signing in Arabic, and all the others are signing in Persian. Why is this the key document, basically, for Jewish-Christian relations in Kerala? But not only for Jewish-Christian relations, but for Jewish-Christian and Muslim and Zoroastrian relations in Kerala. It is the key document because it shows that these um, Abrahamic communities are descendants of Middle Eastern traders, and as such, they belong together. And this relationship, this initial relationship, defines the later relationship between these communities. There have been studies about the Christian community, there have been studies about the Jewish community, but I don't know about any study about the relationship of these two communities. This is what we are doing now. The continuation of this project, in a way, has already started on a number of levels. I myself am very much hoping to continue working on all these polemical texts that we've found. And of course, if you work on a huge handbook, source survey, as we are, you, you, you worry day and night about forgetting important text, right? But now, coming towards the end of it, I think, I'm actually also looking forward to people who are going to say, oh, but you really forgot this important thing and that important thing, because we are putting out the basic grid, and now it will be for up to the next generation to start filling in more dots so that we, we get a complete picture, uh, if we ever can, of, of how people interacted. So I'm actually looking forward to all the people who are going to say, you forgot this important piece of poetry or this important saint's life. Uh, that would, that would show that we have given a boost to research with what we've done. In the future, theoretically, we could think of excavation, but before we do that, there are a lot more sites, a lot more relevant sites that we haven't yet had the chance to visit. I think we formed a great network uh, 
of uh, scholars looking into these matters and we are still connected so despite uh, the project ending uh, this network will not end and we will keep investigating with the historic uh, historiographical biography that we are um, still writing and we will be writing it for a few more years i think um, also there is this continuation of our work which is really nice so it will not just be like a flip and the project is finished but we will keep working and when I think about the Ethiopian section it feels like we just started. 15 years and in which we collected uh, some th over 1200 Syriac and Malayalam manuscripts, over 60,000 palm leaves and this huge material is there to be processed and now within this project we are processing only some of this. I can say we have been able or I have been able to indicate what are the directions of research uh, that could be continued by uh, other scholars or myself or maybe my own PhD students in the future. If we study these things in the past, we may get a better understanding of how to think about how people function in the present. And one of the advantages to studying these kinds of relationships in the past and using them as a basis for some of our theories about how this works is the people in the Middle Ages can't come back and argue with you in a way. So they can't accuse you of um, political bias or there's, no, there's nothing personal invested in the same way as if one starts talking about, say, Muslim-Jewish relations in Germany. Um, because the people there are still living and it's a very living question that one has to deal with. Whereas in the past, you, we have a certain sort of emotion and we have little capacity to step back emotionally from these kinds of relations and think about, well, how do these work? and how could they work better. In the news lately, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the rise of anti-Semitic outbreaks, comments, uh, attacks on synagogues, and so forth. Also, there's been a great deal of concern about Muslim communities in Europe and in the United States, for example. What part of this project does is take the conversation about how people of different religions and different regions get along or don't get along outside of the European context. And by doing that, we allow ourselves to think about other models and other histories.